I'm Rhea Cohn. I'm the conservation coordinator here at Swanner. Um, and I use she, her pronouns. And tonight, thank you all for joining us in person. Uh, we're really excited to hear from our three presenters about their work in fire ecology and wildfire. Um, uh, our goal here at Swanner is to preserve, educate, and nurture. That is our mission. And I feel that this topic really can't hit on all three of those uh, more. So it's really host close to home. This um, talk is part of Swanner's Walks, Talks, and Workshop series, which is has all kinds of events, just like the title suggests, guided tours and walks, talks like this, panels, uh, lectures, and then workshops as well. So you can come get your hands dirty in a, a variety of ways. This uh, event in particular is also in partnership with Summit County's Living with Wildfire series. So that's been a summer long series. I think that there's one more event coming up. Um, so hope that you can attend that as well. Uh, an important part of engaging in nature here on the Swanner Preserve is recognizing that the Swanner Preserve and Eco Center resides on the ancestral, traditional and contemporary homelands of the Northwestern Band of the Shoshone and the Ute Indian tribe. And in offering this land acknowledgement, we affirm indigenous sovereignty, history, and experiences. So before I introduce our presenters and we get started with our event tonight, I wanna also thank Summit County's RAP Tax, which funds a huge portion of our walks, talks, and workshop series. Tonight is going a little bit differently than we had originally planned. Um, and our first speaker is Brad Washa. He is zooming in from um, the Cedar Creek Fire in Oregon. Um, and he has third, more than 33 years of federal wild land fire management service in over 400 fires. Um, and he retired as the state fuel specialist for the BLM in Utah. And we're gonna hear a little bit more from him. Well, thanks Brad, take it away. Well, thanks Rhea. Well, I apologize for not being there in person with um, the rest of the panel. Um, we, we talked about this earlier this summer as far as uh, what would happen if I did get called up on a fire. And of course, I haven't been on a fire until um, 14 days ago when I got dispatched with the Alaska Incident Management Team to the east zone of the Cedar Creek fire. So again, apologize for that, but we'll make it work. And uh, um, excited to uh, be able to share a little bit about my experience in wildland fire and, and how I, I've seen climate change impact that. And uh, I, 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 do, I am actually a local resident. I live in Pine Brook. And, uh, and like Rhea said, I retired at the beginning of the year. So I wanted to kind of just use uh, here. Um, I wanted to look a little bit about my past history, but uh, also, you know, trying to figure out what, what was something that I could share in fire as far as how it relates to climate change. And I thought about um, with the Alaska team that I'm with um, up in Alaska, there's Portage Glacier and in 1986. They built uh, a visitor center to be able to view the glacier. And by the mid nineties, that visitor center, you can no longer see the glacier from, from the visitor center itself. And, and what, what do we have in fire that would um, look at that? Also, Alaska has a large um, fire um, load. Um, this year, nearly 3 million acres burnt up in Alaska. And uh, this was a, a fire north of the Arctic Circle, which isn't necessarily rare, but uh, they're seeing fires farther farther north um, than they have seen in the past, or at least the extent of those fires have, have increased. So as far as looking at my career, um, my career started at Mesa Verde in 1989. Um, in 91, I started working on my graduate work at Colorado State. In 92, while at Colorado State, I switched from the Park Service to the Forest Service on the Arapaho Roosevelt. In 94, um, took some time and worked for the Nature Conservancy before returning back to the Forest Service in New Mexico. And uh, in 1999, switched over to the Bureau of Land Management in Medford, Oregon. And 2004, came over to the BLM in Utah and have been here ever since, retiring uh, this last year from, uh, from the BLM. Although I still continue to do um, wildland fire assignments and, and do some work around Park City, um, ha have left federal service. So I wanted to look at some of those uh, time periods. When I first came to Mesa Verde, I was a, an undergrad back in Wisconsin at the University of Wisconsin Stevens Point. And um, I was pretty happy if as a seasonal, I got you know 100 to 200 hours of overtime. Um, this day and age, that's changed a lot. And in, in 1989, if you were on what was called a hotshot group, 
you know, looking at more like two or 300 to 500 hours of overtime. And, and to put that in perspective, a seasonal employee is on what's called a 1039 appointment. So basically working six months, five days a week, eight hour days, um, that's 1,039 hours. And uh, in when, around the 2000 period, um, hotshot crews, if th they were starting to get a thousand hours of overtime each year and the last few years, uh, 12, 13, even 1500 hours of overtime is not an unseen thing. So although, um, you know, that's not science, um, it's, it's one way to look at um, how fire loads have increased. And I looked at back, you know, the last 10 years, I've, I've averaged about 500 hours of overtime. And that wasn't even in a fire specific position. I was the state fuel specialist. So I had other responsibilities and, and fire was kind of a side thing going on on incident management teams. But at Mesa Verde, um, when I first arrived in 1989, they had their largest fire, the Long Mesa fire. Um, that fire was 2,600 acres, but it was the largest fire in the park's history at that point in time. Since that time, more than 65% of the park has burned and, uh, you know, representative of, you know, increasing uh, fire load. And all those were natural lightning caused fires. When I moved to the Rappel Roosevelt, um, one of our largest fires was a fire near their Colorado State University campus. It's that fire in the middle of the screen and uh, in, in the green there. Um, that was in 1994. That fire was um, 1,500 acres. Over time though, um, we've seen an increase in fires as you get closer to the Colorado Front Range um, towards Fort Collins. On the left side of the screen is the Continental Divide, uh, 2012 the High Park fire, and then 2020, the Cameron Peak fire that basically went from the Continental Divide all the way down into the Colorado Front Range. When I was on the Cibola National Forest, um, this was our fire crew, and uh, five of those folks were students. One of them was a teacher, and largely you could fight fire with students and teachers, and uh, you know that, that was a common practice. This day and age, with the extending fire seasons, we are seeing where it's, it's really hard to have someone be a student and also fight fire unless they want to take their spring semester off or a fall semester off and still do fire. When I got to the Medford BLM, um, we had the biscuit fire. And to date, that was like the largest fire um, in Oregon history at half a, just shy of half a million acres. Um, during that time, the president came out to, to visit and the National Fire Plan came into being. But uh, that uh, you know, half a million acres is, or five hundred million acres is is half a million acres is is a large thing. Moved to the Utah State Office, and uh, um, again went up to Alaska on a couple fires. Again, this this fire north of the Arctic Circle, the Chukchi Complex, was over half a million acres. And uh, you know, up there, a lot of times we allow fires in natural processes to occur. But in this case, that was occurring, but we were protecting around villages and in holdings. Uh, in 2020, had the chance to go down to Australia and they had, I, mean, I, I can't even tell you the numbers because they were in hectare acres, but uh, a lot, you know, largely much of Vancouver um, or Victoria, sorry, um, had fire throughout the whole um, province. And then two years ago in California, actually had my first giga fire. Um, this was the August complex. I believe it was about 30 fires that came together into one, um, started by a lightning storm that came through, but over a million acres in uh, size. So looking at climate change and wildland fire, one of my thoughts was how can I look at this? Those were all um, examples, you know, just looking at through my career, but not, not looking at hard data. So wanted to start looking at things. And at first I did a presentation on this topic a couple of years ago and thought about the ice off dates in Wisconsin on the lake that my parents live on and how that number has decreased over time. The number of days uh, between the first of the year and uh, when the ice comes off. One thing that this chart doesn't factor in that there's been a couple of years that we haven't had ice on the first of the year on Big Cedar Lake. So started thinking about how could I chart out um, wildfires? And this chart looks at um, from 1915 all the way to um, last last year. And you can see, you know, starting around the 1988 time period when Yellowstone took off, 
where fire did um, start increasing in size. And, you know, we're gaining years where we're seeing over 7 million acres burn in the 11 Western states. Um, the quadrennial fire review also started looking at the number of fire days in a season and going from nearly 200 days a year when I started to having 300 days. And instead of what we call a fire season, we're, we're actually calling it the fire year. And you can almost be on fires um, any month of the year throughout the United States. It's also having an impact on the cost. Um, when I started out in fire with the Forest Service, just shy of 16% of their budget was going towards fire. In 2015, 52% of their budget was going towards fire. And it's predicted that only 33% of their budget will go towards non-fire activities in 2025. Started also looking, when I look, started looking at data was, what, what are some of the temperatures and, and trying to bring this back to Utah, um, what, what has happened as far as temperatures go? And in 1895 from uh, 2015, the last date that I had this chart updated for, uh, you know, we saw about a three degree increase in temperatures in the mean annual temperature for, for Utah based on Salt Lake City. Um, the number of things we're starting to see is, in addition to an increased number of large fires over a thousand acres, we're starting to see impacts as far as the spring average temperature increasing and that spring water equivalent dropping off. And uh, what impact does that have on wildfires? So for us in, in Park City, you know, one of our major concerns, uh, this is when I was patrolling it when it was still the canyons, I was a volunteer patrol there, but you can see there's not a lot of snow on the slopes in the background. And what sort of impact does that have on the fire environment um, when we see snow coming off? So a number of things come to mind as far as early season snow melts is one, those fuels are available for fire and uh, there's not that moisture that's gonna stay around. So the fire season has the potential of starting earlier and uh, the, the vegetation was not gonna pick up as much moisture as it might otherwise, if that moisture was hanging around. And we can see, um, you know, in this, this slide shows the um, summer mean temperature. Again, a similar three degree increase for um, Utah and, and data taken from uh, Salt Lake City. So summer concerns with increasing temperatures are we're getting hotter and drier summers. So your fuels are dr drying out sooner. There's not as much moisture, both in the live fuel and the dead and down material in, in the uh, fire environment. And uh, it's, it is increasing our fire behavior. We're seeing, you know, where we would have seen surface fires to seeing more stand destroying type events where you have crown fire behavior. And uh, that that is, um, something that we are seeing in our fire environment and we're putting firefighters. Chuck and Q a number of years ago at a Yellowstone conference looked at a thing called the energy release component. It's, it's kind of a drought indicator. The energy release component actually is looking at the, uh, the heat per unit area along the flaming front of a fire. So I don't wanna get into the technicalities of it, but one, one thing you could see was in 88, that ERC level, um, which, which basically is in, in a way of a drought indicator. Um, it, it was spiking at a several locations, including Old Faithful and Mammoth, along with a little bit at Heben, Heben, Um, But what is important here, I think, is looking at the, uh, the, the, the direction that that ERC level, that maximum yearly ERC is going and, and seeing an increase over time. So I want to try to replicate that on some fires that I was involved with within Utah. So I first looked at the Box Canyon fire this fire happened uh, up, above Smith and Morehouse um, Reservoir in the headwaters of the Weber River Basin. And you can see the uh, acreage on this fire. Um, pay attention to that as we progress through the slides. So um, this fire was in 2016. And uh, a couple things were going on in this area. One, they didn't really want to put firefighters in to fight the fire. There was concerns because there were um, a lot of dead and down material. Uh, those snags have the potential, and snags, not snakes. Um, sometimes my Wisconsin accent gets away on me. But uh, those snags have the potential of hitting a, a firefighter. So the intent was to let the fire, we, we corral it in certain areas, but let the fire burn in, in certain areas. And this area suffered both uh, a lodgepole pine bark beetle kill 
about 15 years prior to the fire. And then uh, within five years from the fire, Eastern spruce budworm came in and, and impacted the spruce and fir. Um, some days fire wasn't very aggressive, but the important thing here I see is, you know, looking at the Camas Ranger District from 1980, so 35 years of data, um, the Camas Ranger District only recorded 3,276 acres burnt. That fire alone was almost 1,500 acres greater than 35 years of data. And uh, looking at that ERC that I showed you for um, Yellowstone, you can see how since 1983 from the Norway Raws, how that level has increased over time and uh, you know, impacting how we're seeing fires burned. And this, this sort of strategic analysis is one of the products that I produce on fires and, and my role on this fire is a strategic operations section chief. Um, also, um, Looking at you know that that fire was in August, um, in August, in September, and into the fall is when we typically like to do a lot of prescribed burning within both the BLM and Forest Service and, and, and Forestry Fire and State Lands. And looking at those ERC trends there, we're seeing you know kind of that similar sort of trajectory with the ERCs increasing. And uh, the Marshall Drop prescribed burn, I thought was in many ways the textbook prescribed burn. We were trying to reduce some of the pinion juniper encroachment down into the sagebrush flats. And out of that, we were seeing um, little seeps and springs and creeks develop. And that uh, was a great thing. But uh, five years later, started seeing cheatgrass come into the area. And that's a major concern. And, and one that I'd like to close on is the cheatgrass expansion that we started seeing this summer around Park City. And with that, you know, a lot of times we'd go up to Ecker Hill every year and see a little bit of cheatgrass, but this year started seeing it blanketing the uh, landscape. Uh, next, or on Swanner Preserve and going up to Glen Wild, seeing it along the roadsides. But then when you get into some of the areas adjacent to the roadside, seeing where we're having some decadent sagebrush occur. And uh, within that sagebrush, we're seeing cheatgrass occur. Tollgate fire from 2018. This was this summer that that purple colored uh, vegetation is cheatgrass. Uh, went up up Jeremy Ranch to take a picture, a repeat some repeat photography of Pine Brook, but uh, hiking up there, um, you know, again seeing cheatgrass. I think this is the Centennial Trail, if I can remember right. But uh, and then down East Canyon, not as bad, but but little places along the roadside, and and this is a major concern. Um, and I'm going to get into the reason reasons why, but cheatgrass loves to grow basically where other things won't grow. So up by the Red Hawk and the preserve can see it in some of just the rocks or, you know, right in front of the preserve sign, you've got cheatgrass growing. Silver Summit, same thing, likes areas where there's disturbance. So what is cheatgrass? It's a highly invasive exotic species of winter annual. Uh, we once thought that cheatgrass wouldn't grow above 6,500 feet. And we're starting to have different thoughts about that because of the growing season. The growing season has been expanded. We're seeing soil temperatures increase, especially on the southern aspects. Moisture availability and a reduction in snowpack, where before the snow would have been covering areas where cheatgrass is now growing, um, that's being exposed earlier in the season. So this explosion that we've seen within cheatgrass, you know, starting to look at, is it a, an element of climate change, prolonged drought? We did have a fairly wet autumn last year, but this, this explosion of cheatgrass is being seen throughout the West. And, uh, it's, it's widely being found throughout the Park City area this summer and a major concern. One question is, is there enough resiliency and resistance within the environment um, along the Wasatch back that cheatgrass won't take over like it has in many parts of the Great Basin? Management of cheatgrass, um, early detection and rapid response, appropriate scope and scale. Cheatgrass seeds, they can be viable for up to three to five years. So it's a major concern. And this is the roundabout in Jeremy Ranch uh, that we've got cheatgrass growing right in the rocks. Um, it, it likes to, it, it kind of gets a jump start on the natural vegetation and significant concern for disturbed areas. There are some treatment options for it um, that include herbicide and something that we probably do need to start looking at within, uh, within the Park City area. And we have had some discussions on Swanner Nature Preserve as far as what might be some options to deal with. So in closing, you know, looking at climate change and ad addressing it, Fire definitely is having a role, and we are seeing some increased fire activity within the Park City area. Here's a map of fire starts for the last 19 years. Really haven't had any major large fires, but when you start 
increasing the scope and looking a little bit farther out, start seeing a few more fires that uh, are of larger size. And, uh, you know, when you start looking at the greater Salt Lake area along both the Wasatch Front and Wasatch Back, um, we have seen an increase in fire activity. And uh, this might be in part because of climate change. And just in closing, um, this uh, I like the statement from Jim Agee. Uh, the natural fire regimes of the past are not the regimes of the present, nor will they be the regimes of the future. And, and one way of looking at our fire regimes and, and how, 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 what role will cheatgrass have and, and other influencers uh, because of climate change in Park City. So with that, I'll turn it back to you unless there's, I think we're going to try to save questions for the end unless someone's got like a, a major uh, question that, that they have to hear an answer or response to right away. Great, thank you, Brad. How's it, should I open the windows? How's everybody doing? Good, all right. I think you should bring back that sweet hair though. So, uh, but thank you so much for joining us from uh, Oregon tonight. I really appreciate it. And um, it was great to hear that. So if you could stop sharing your screen and we'll, we'll hear from Jess next. Um, we'll hear from Jess Kirby, who is the Summit County Public Lands Manager, and she's a career uh, public servant and has worked in the natural resource and land management arena for many years from state and county levels. So we'll pull up her presentation and we can get started. I'm honored to be here with the other speakers. Um, I didn't think to bring my pictures from the 80s. I could have riled the mullet there. I did have quite a big wave with some crimp going on. So I'm just saying, but uh, anyhow, so I'm Jess Kirby. Um, I am the uh, public lands manager for Summit County. It's a little bit of an interesting title. I don't just work on our, four, our federal lands. Um, I work on private um, cross boundary work for, between the federal, state, and public lands in our county. It's a relatively new position. I was brought on to start um, helping mitigate and bring funding to the landscape scale uh, fire reduction and watershed health projects, along with managing our open space and um, the geo bond that we just passed as well. So glad to be here. here we go. So, um, my talk is going to be more of a land management side of things and bringing in, you know, decision making and, and how we go forward. But, you know, the decisions that we make as land managers really do affect our livelihood and, and why we live here and, you know, our quality of life. And so it's a lot of pressure, actually. You know, you have to think um, best practices and how you're going to implement um, and how we're going to, you know, see the end, the end game here. Um, I, I love this slide. I always use it. Um, it's a, she's a professor up at USU, Dr. Larissa. She, I just, it's, it's that perspective. What's our takeaways? You know, there is, there is no fireless option. Okay, number one. Uh, number two, not all fire is bad, right? We need to start thinking that way. And then maybe more fire is a good option. Um, and so some of those things to take away from today as, as management tools. Um, oh my slides are a little cut off there, but um, so wildfire in the West. Um, so in the past two years, um, every Western state in the US has had a fire over 500,000 acres, except Utah. Why is that, right? I don't think, I don't know that I have the answer, but I wanted to put that out there. Um, we are due, that's what I will say. Um, and what is fire intensity and why maybe we haven't had the fires or why we see the fires we do. I um, wanted to go um, kind of tag along with what Brad closed out with, with fire regimes and how we think about fire and how things are changing. But historically, we think of fire intensity as low, moderate, and severe. Um, good pictures there to give you ideas. Low intensity, meaning ground fire, moderate, getting some patches, severe, you're getting some significant damage. But is it bad damage? You know, it's perspective, so think about that. Um, and so with frequency of these low, moderate, and high intensities, um, the low intensities are more frequent. It's kind of counterintuitive, right? But you have more frequent fires, you have less fire. Um, when you get into the high intensity, you get your higher elevations, it's less likely to burn, but when you do have fire, you're gonna have a lot of it, okay? Because you have more material and different species. And then that middle ground is that mixed to low severity, 
And that's kind of where we sit in the Wasatch is that um, we're not on the low end. That's usually like Ponderosa Pine areas. The high end is more uh, up in the, the Uinas, high Uinas where you get spruce and fir and it's, it's really moist. So we're kind of in that dry middle zone. And then talking about fire regimes, you know, this is the way we were all taught in college to think about fire. Um, but it is a fundamental way of thinking about, you know, changing climate, wildfire patterns, um, impacts of vegetation, and the characterization of our carbon cycle. And I, you know, I don't know that most people realize that you can track fire in tree rings, right? You can do a slice and see back. Fire has been a part of our, our world. It, we are predisposed to burn. And that is our reality. Um, so what is a fire regime? This is a map co that comes out of land fire. Um, it's showing, um, I don't know if you can see my yellow circle. That was probably not the best color to choose. But that's Utah there in the circle. We basically sit in the low to mixed and replacement landscape scale fire zone, which means we're looking at fire regimes of anywhere from 35 to 35 to 200 years. And what's a fire regime? It's not a single fire, but it's, a, it's an event, a long-term event of multiple fires and how you can um, judge that on vegetation and how it burns and how often and what that frequency is. Oops. But then there's this thing called fire exclusion. And you know, that started, we know back when, when Smokey was shaming us for fire. Fire was bad. You didn't want it. You know, th this is my favorite poster. It's like the shameful waste, right? And now we're going full 100%, 360 degrees around saying, let's put fire on the ground. Let's do this. Come with me. Let's, you know, it's okay to have smoke. It's okay to do this. It's okay to see disturbance. It's okay. And it, we spent 100 years telling everyone, don't do it. And so changing that behavior, um, you know, in the 1930s, there was the starting of the 10 a.m. policy. Um, that means you see a fire, it's out by 10 a.m. You know, we were re got really, really good at putting fires out. Um, but that really did set us up for a fire problem, not a solution. And then in our area, most of us probably live in the Wooey. You know, I have trees right outside of my house in Summit Park. I know Brad's got some outside of his, and I know that <laughs> others in the room do too. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, the wildland urban interface is what Wooey is. Um, and we live smack dab in the middle of it right here.
um, about how much of Summit County is on the wildland urban interface? It's debatable. So I, I, the conversation that's going on right now is where do you draw the line? Um, and I think if, if you all watched the news last year at the fire in Brighton, Colorado, you know, that was, is that the wooey? You know, it was a grass fire that caught the house to house to house inferno. So where is that wildland urban interface? And at the state level, they are debating that right now, but you know, 60%, 80%, a lot, most of our county. Thank you. I think that's some good kind of context to keep in mind. Um, in our county here. So thank you, Jess. Um, last but not least, we are going to hear from Dr. Paul Rogers. He is an adjunct professor in the Department of Environment and Society and a USU Ecology Center associate and the director of the Western Aspen Alliance, um, home of those awesome stickers over there. Make sure you get one of those. Cool. Take it away, Paul. Um as Ria said, I'm Paul Rogers. I'm an adjunct professor. I do a lot of uh, outreach. I do a lot of education, professional training centered around Aspen species, Aspen communities, everything that's related to them. You'd be surprised how much there is. However, I've been doing things uh, revolving around the field of disturbance ecology and fire ecology, uh, fire being one disturbance of many. Think of avalanches, bug kills, all kinds of other things that happen in forests that sort of uh, kill trees and replace them. And I'm going to try to impart you with an ecological perspective here that's even gonna go farther than the others said in terms of the positivity of those things. I should say at the outset that none of this stuff is unprecedented in one of my least favorite words in the English language. However, what is unprecedented is the amount of building and build up that we as human beings have done in these very fire prone landscapes. That is unprecedented. So keep that in mind as we go through this. Um, I have a bit of a roadmap here and I tend to move around. So I wanna talk about fires vary. Jess covered that um, and Brad talked about that a little bit. Fire as the bad boy. I'm gonna attack a lot of what you hear in the media because as a public, we get some really skewed messages. And this is really problematic if we're trying to effectively and positively deal with these situations. Uh, and then how, we, how do we use fire in a positive way? Again, this was touched on by the previous speakers. Fire and climate, I'm gonna dive a little deeper than the others, give you some long-term things. It's pretty problematic when we only look at 30-year ranges or we only look at the last 10 years because the, the, the climate has definitely changed, some of that being natural and some of that being what we call now climate change. I'll, I'll get to that in a minute. And then the living with fire, that's the center of this entire topic, what we're trying to do here today. So I'm gonna do all this in five slides too. So we'll see if that works. This is your typical ex-urban community. This happens to be, um, darn, Red Lodge, Montana. Um, and this is a little bit of what Jess talked about, but I'm gonna make it a little bit more graphic because all fire is not the same. I went off the bottom of the screen there. This says um, uh, grasslands and shrublands at the bottom there. And all of these things burn very differently. And we should be really aware of that. Um, so starting uh, at the top, and again, fire regimes, what does that mean? Um, there's fire regimes and there's fire severity, and let me touch on both of those. So the spruce fir, the highest forests, and by the way, this pattern is mirrored in terms of latitude as well. So as we go from Utah to the boreal forest in Canada or Alaska, you'd see a similar pattern here. Really long time periods that these things burn in some natural phases, right? And then coming down, pines and Douglas firs, which is kind of around this area. Um, Aspen, uh, fire is somewhat rare in that, and it becomes less rare the more conifers come into Aspen. Um, and that's where I spend a lot of my time. I wanted to really get this message across. Uh, they use the verbiage in this uh, 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 firewise landscaping of keep it clean and green, and this kind of moves over into your territory, Kelly. Uh, if things are clean and green, lawns do not burn, right? These uh, exotic tree species here do not burn very much. There's some real misnomers there about how threatened we are depending on our communities. That place, Paradise, um, California, was completely forested 
uh, by natural species, you might say, and a lot of dry grass and shrubs. That's really different than a lot of Central Park City or a lot of Utah communities where we have lawns and irrigation all over the place. These are, if not completely fire resistant, let's just be more conservative and say fire would be very rare. So don't get too worried about the fire coming over the hill and burning through these communities. That would be pretty difficult to do if you're watering and irrigating all the time. So vegetation is central to all of this, right? And these exotic tree species in developed areas, whether urban or ex-urban, um, are, are unlikely to burn, but it depends on what vegetation you have. We should also keep in mind this whole unprecedented bit that we hear a lot about in the news. California uh, take away all the houses in an extremely fire prone landscape from the bottom of the Sierras almost to the top. It just is. And so these things burn. Uh, and that point was made by the others, but I just wanted to reinforce that a little bit. And then severity, right? It kind of goes along a hierarchy as well. These forests burn very rarely, but they burn in very severe ways. Same with boreal forests way far north. Brad mentioned a, a 500,000 acre fire in, in, the, uh, in Northern Alaska. So rare fires, but boy, do they burn hot and they burn everything, right? And a spruce fir, and it goes down the line. So uh, these grasslands, many of which are being invaded by cheatgrass, uh, he didn't quite um, explicitly state that the whole issue with cheatgrass is what they call hot and flashy. So it's an invasive species from Eurasia, where I just was last week, uh, that is, is uh, invasive to the Western US. It's spreading very fast, but it burns hot and flashy. It lives and dies in the first uh, uh, last month of spring and the first month of summer. Then you have this hot, dry, essentially hay all, all across the landscape that catches fire really easy and it conveniently grows next to roads where what happens, right? We throw stuff out our windows like sometimes cigarettes and other things that are flammable. So that's the whole threat of cheatgrass. Hot, flashy, can burn. Uh, you can't see this here, but you know, every three to you know, five, 10, 15 years, it can burn pretty frequently, even sometimes less frequently than that. So just quickly, aspen, all aspen doesn't burn alike. And some people are starting to treat aspen as something that we want to treat for around our ex-urban and developed areas, uh, like Park City, for example. You might actually manage heavily, uh, and I'll return to this theme in a minute, uh, for aspen to reduce the probability of fire, right? It's about probabilities. In a hot, windy day with a big fire, all bets are off. However, on your average fire, whatever that is, Aspen can help reduce the spread of flames. So it may be a strategy depending on how wild your home area is for managing. But basically, I just want to point out there's sort of two kinds of Aspen. Cyril is just a fancy word for over time, it progresses to being dominated by conifers and stable, meaning that it, it remains dominated by Aspen for hundreds of years. Um, in fact, if you're aware of the Pando clone, which I do some research on, that's in the stable type community. We just published a paper that says that there was low levels of fire over 9,000 years based on uh, soil charcoals and so on. So there's different types of fire. Aspen doesn't burn well. It's thought to be used as a preventative mechanism and, and the stable aspen would rarely burn. <clears throat> so, um, this idea, I don't know where the wording is, it's gone off the screen, I guess. This is the frame that's about fire as the bad boy. This is the, what we hear in the news all the time. And I want to kind of push back on that a little more firmly. We see these words all the time, then it drives me nuts. It drives any of us nuts to deal in wildland ecology or fire ecology or anything. It's a disaster. The whole forest is ruined. Uh, the forest is lost. We talk about the high costs and we put price tags on them and so on, but we use all of this pejorative terminology. Uh, and this happens to be from Western Wyoming on some private land where there's a bunch of houses scattered in there. Some of them burned, some of them survived. It depends on how many preventative measures they took that are in the firewise landscape. Uh, but we spend little time talking about this, this wonderful renewal. This is from the Wallow Fire in, uh, in Eastern Arizona. 
Um, and it's again, 500,000 acres. These are huge fires, right? Half a million acres. And there's a lot of diversity coming back, including aspen stems all over the place, even though all the trees are burned. Same you could find from the Yellowstone 1988 fires. But we just don't see that in our news. And this, these are really important messages to get across. There's a lot of positive aspects to fire. Um, and then we've spent a lot of energy trying to put them out. I would argue a little bit that um, we haven't been as successful as some people think, but we've been more successful, generally speaking, at lower mid elevations than at higher elevations. And stuff just does burn a lot, which both of the uh, previous speakers mentioned. Uh, again, where my screen is not as large as what was on it, but this is the, um, the how to use fire. This is a prescribed fire. They lit, it, lit this fire on purpose. In this case, it was in the Pando clone, uh, thought to be the world's largest living organism in near Fish Lake, Utah. And we just burned a small section, a half a hectare, half a, about an acre experimentally. Um, <clears throat> but I would really like to get across this idea to everyone. This is a, you, you might say, a proposed strategy to think about these things. If I was the king tomorrow, I'd wave a wand and we would sort of approach these things this way. But we have this kind of continuum from developed areas where the circle is out to wilderness, a land designation. You might say this is your matrix of national forest land. This might be your park service land or some other kind of state reserve lands where there's less and less uh, desire to alter landscapes or to, to take commercial products off of them. Um, the key to that is that you have a similar range of active to passive management. So we would do more to prevent fire from harming people's homes and houses. Near, uh, near developed areas, when we get away from those areas, we would try to let nature and or prescribed burning emulation of natural processes take a key role. That's the concept behind this very simple idea However, we haven't done that. We've run out, we've sent people jumping out of airplanes. We've done all kinds of things to really attack fires, um, uh, maybe to little um, successful ends, uh, perhaps some negative ends, altering communities, uh, spending huge amounts of money. Um, and what are we doing here? Again, I would say the only thing that's unprecedented about these fires, even in even in climate change scenarios now we're talking about, is the amount that we've pushed into them and developed and then crying out loud when everything, when things burn or, or people get injured or hurt. Those are bad things, don't get me wrong. However, that's the part that's changed. In the past, we didn't develop, in, and I'm talking hundreds and thousands of years past. So let's move into that whole climate thing. This is just the high severity fire and the regrowth of it. Uh, this is sort of what a um, little bit old chart here, but it, it looks at two different um, uh, elements here. Uh, precipitation, which is very hard to predict in terms of climate change, but temperature we have more confidence in. And we see big changes in temperature in northern Utah here. We're a little iffy, but in southern Utah, we know that there's going to be some pretty large increases in temperature over time. So more confidence in temperature than precipitation more of a dice rolling scenario and precipitation, but we do know the planet is warming and that humans are at the center of why that's happening. This is why I want to get away from the 30 year uh, projections, which is a common framework for climate change folks. Look at 30 years. This is 1000 years. I have actually the data for 2000 years. Very quickly, this is done by uh, lining up 100 years of temperature data uh, and um, coordinating it with tree rings. And then uh, we only have the temperature data for this last hundred years or so. This line is about the, the, the turn of the from 19th to 20th century. But then we, we uh, coordinate that with tree rings and we have tree ring data for up to 2000 years or more. So that's how we come up with this drought severity index known as the Palmer drought severity index uh, for very long periods. Um, so unprecedented? No way, right? There's huge time periods where we had lots of dry and lots of fire, right? 
uh, but we didn't have the development we have today. We didn't push into those areas and build a lot of homes and so on. So we just need to be aware of that. Um, the whole point of this is it's leading up to, oops, Let's see if you can see that. I may, may have lost my top bullet there. Uh, but number one, climate drives fire. Climate in the 20th century, by the way, the wettest decade in the last 2000 years, I mean, the wettest century, the 20th century. So why not so many fires in the 20th century? Fire suppression or climate? Clearly climate takes the lead. It was a very wet century, even though there's the 1930s and 1950s, sorry, 30s and 50s. You had the droughty periods, but on average, a very wet century. So we didn't burn a lot. Well, now that the climate is changing, natural and unnatural, we should expect to see a lot more fire. And we're getting around to the living with fire part. So it is certainly getting hotter and drier in the 21st century. We should expect more fire. The other speakers have already said that. And this is what it looks like. Go figure, the fire did not respect this person's land boundary. This is from Alaska. Recall that I said boreal forest, hot and dry. Um, and uh, it's hot and dry, but they also burn very severe. So everything is burned right across the land. I wanna say that I'm basing a lot of this on this really great paper. Um, folks can look it up later if they want, but it's adapt to more wildfire in the West in Western North American forests as climate changes. That's the take home message tonight. We're not gonna make it go away and we're not gonna stop it with firefighting. That's just not gonna happen. So how do we how do, we do that? Um, <clears throat> The FireWise stuff here, I think this is on page nine of that booklet, but basically I think you've probably seen this before, but near your home, clear away brush and shrubs, you don't put firewood under your home and so on. Uh, again, more protection nearby, it's similar to my landscape, except this is on a smaller level, more uh, active management, you might say, at your home, less so a little farther away, and almost none is needed here. And these boundaries are, what are they? Uh, 30 feet from home, up to 100 feet from home, 100 to 200 feet from your home, if you have that much land. Yeah, wow, we're missing big parts of these slides. Uh, down here, I will manually read the, my, who sponsors this, the Western Aspen Alliance, the BLM, uh, Utah State University, Ecology Center, and Natural Resources. And I will end with that and we can move on to the panel. So thank you very much. The kind of idea of regeneration that Paul mentioned and something that really came to mind for me was, Brad, your report that you put together on the, the Parley's fire. I don't know, has anyone seen that? Brad shared on like Nextdoor um, and some other social media, but maybe could you share a little bit about what you saw that's really close to home and something that people um, have in mind. There we go, we see you again. Kind of what you saw in terms of regeneration in that, in that area that was burned last year. Well, I think it kind of relates to some of the discussion Paul had. Um, there were various ecosystems within the Parley's Canyon fire from the Gamble's Oak where the fire started um, up to mixed conifer, mostly white, white fir. Um, there was also aspen stands on the backside. Um, one of the concerns really though was, especially in that mixed conifer, what would come back in that high intensity um, crown destroying type event. And I, I, I look at it in, in regards to climate change too. I mean, would, what, were we gonna see the Gambles Oak move up the, the slope a little bit more? Would we see the, the mixed conifer return, which would take a long time because again, you know, like Paul talked about and Jessica talked about, you know, that that's a mixed fire regime. So. We anticipate in, in some of that mixed conifer to see that stand destroying event. That's a, a natural thing. It's it's not necessarily a normal, but what, what's going to return? And, and we have had concern with some of the large fires that have occurred um, within the Intermountain region, Rocky Mountain region, what's what's coming back. And and to, to I, I wouldn't say to my surprise, but uh, you know, basically the, the uh, aspen roots have been just sitting there waiting for fire to come through that mixed conifer stand. And we did see a good level of regeneration of, of aspen, both where aspen did exist prior and uh, in areas of mixed conifer. Great, thank you. Just let me reinforce what, is this on? What Brad said, 
Um, a statement was made earlier that it's farther and farther from the seeds. Well, I think you're all aware that um, at least a good portion of aspen doesn't need seed because the growth is from the roots, right? A cool thing that's going on now is we're discovering more that aspen also regenerates from seed. I mean, we knew that all along, but we used to say this is very rare. Now we're finding it on almost every fire. We didn't know what to look for. And that has essentially no range limit. The seeds are very tiny. If you think of cottonwood and they can float for tens of miles. So uh, different species, the seeds are heavier or lighter and, and depending on what they are, but aspen doesn't need the seeds. It regenerates from the root, first of all, and then seeds can travel a long way uh, with different mechanisms. But some of these things like the, um, uh, Hayman fire in Colorado, where there's big stark landscapes, the seed distance is a big issue. Um, and it's and it's still, as uh, Jess pointed out, pretty stark. And you know, it's interesting. I, I went for a walk up on the Parley's fire a week after it happened, and there were already oak, you know, seedlings coming up. And they'll do the same thing. They'll root generate after fire. They do very successful regeneration. You know, you, you don't see pines coming up that quickly, but you do see the aspen and the, the oak. Um, shoots come up pretty quickly. So, I mean, it, it's not a devastated landscape. Um, and I, we were really lucky with that fire and the fact that it was small and it wasn't that intense. So um, it will probably recover quite nicely. And it, and it created that patch that we are looking for. You know, you want that change of landscape. So. Any other questions? Anybody else? Come in. <laughs> So the aspen seeds for regenerating, is it just wind carrying the seed or is it carried through birds and animals and then redeposited? Yeah, great question. With aspen, it can do a fantastic job with wind alone. Yeah, so, but other species are carried by birds, uh, particularly different pines and so on. So uh, that does happen. And, the, and, and any and all means of transport are fair game. <laughs> Paul, so that, that seed transfer um, question from, from myself here. Um, the seed transfer, we're not going to see that this year on the Parley's Canyon fire. And that, that would be something we'd be seeing three to four years out type of thing. And, and like you said, you know, I think the Yellowstone fires of 88 is a good example. And, and Bill Romy's work up there and, and a couple other folks, you know, at first they didn't even know that they were looking at Aspen. Um, but then it, it came to them that, you know, after year three or four that, hey, that's Aspen that that hadn't been on that site before that somehow seeded in. Yeah, we could tie that right back to climate change. So there's some, again, some really interesting stuff going on, but Aspen regenerating from seed where it had not grown at all before. And, and to put a finer point on that at higher elevations. And one case in Alberta was where they did clear cut logging, which sort of emulates a fire, but new Aspen regenerating at a higher elevation is a pretty good, um, indicator of some climate factors. Uh, but we're seeing that in other places as well where there was no aspen at all. Uh, that's one of the first clues that you have a seedling as opposed to uh, root suckers or sprouts uh, is that, hey, there was not a live aspen here before the fire within a few miles. And then secondly, as, as uh, Brad alluded to, the plant looks completely different the first year or two when it's a seedling. And that's why we, we thought it was rare, but we just, didn't have an eye for it. We didn't know what we were looking for. So in light of this lack of fire across the landscape in Utah, you mentioned we're possibly lucky here. Um, and then of course, fire suppression. It's, and then the, as Paul mentioned, climate over the last century has actually been a little wet. How has that changed the pattern and abundance or distribution of Aspen stands across this area? It, how many, do you have any figures like how many acres has been lost or gained in some way or another? That's interesting. It's a long, complex topic, but I'll, I'll push all that aside. But there was a, some folks about 20 years ago saying the sky was falling, all of Aspen's disappearing, when really it was the 20th century that what I use that word cereal is just that uh, the conifers were advancing. There wasn't a lot of fire. And we're talking on average. It doesn't mean there wasn't fires here and there. Uh, and it, it appeared as if we were quote unquote losing a lot of Aspen. And so they made these grand proclamations by the state that we were losing 50, 60, 70% of all of our Aspen 
when really it was just a natural process in a wetter century. Uh, the inverse is that is we should expect to see Aspen do pretty well uh, with climate change and increased fire, both from spreading from suckers, from roots, and from seeds, we think. The bummer about this, and this is a whole nother topic, is that when all of the young ones are eaten, and let me just kind of give away the punchline, it's usually by so-called wildlife, deer and elk, and also cattle and sheep, and sometimes moose. So lots of issues in there, uh, big change over the 20th century, not really a loss, just a different sort of uh, view of things after a wetter century. We would, see a, we would expect to see a very different view uh, um, my prognosticating here in the next 50 or 100 years. So I actually have an interesting story that goes along with your story and the fact that 20 years ago when I came to Utah, I worked for the RSGIS lab at USU and we were doing the, the national regap um, landscape data layer for the entire um, Southwest. And my job was to drive around all Utah and do vegetation sampling and we got to these um, eco these ecosystems and there was no classification. And I said, well, it's 50-50, it's conifer and aspen. There's no classification in my list. I, don't, I can't pick my number. And we had to elevate it all the way up to the top of the USGS biological division saying, there is a classification here in the Intermountain West. And we ended up naming it the Intermountain West Mixed Aspen Conifer Stand. So there is a new eco region <laughs> based on the fact that we just didn't have a way to describe what you just described. <laughs> it's actually an important point, a lot of this classification and how much have we gained or lost. Your question is simple. The answer gets pretty complicated without me going down that lane too far. Uh, my sort of simple answer would be that's not so bad, but what else is sitting with it? Are there dry shrubs? Are there any conifers? Um, yeah, do you have grass or do you have natural landscaping? All of those things come into play. Gosh, forget, forbid if you see my use of softball. <laughs> Gosh, nice job. forbid if you had cheatgrass moving in under that, which, you know, to, to really hone in on that, talking about severe changes in fire regimes when you introduce cheatgrass. And, I, and that's what the point that Brad and I were trying to make. Uh, so, so what are the other elements would be my next question, but you know, taken on the surface, an aspen or two near your home shouldn't be a big deal. Most times it won't, it's the stuff that's gonna be within 30 feet, 100 feet, 200 feet that you should be more concerned about. And I don't think anybody has shake or wood roofs anymore, but there's some out there, they sure look cool but they're not so cool when the fire embers land on them. They're really bad. So, you know, metal roofs, all these other things that are all outlined in this, uh, in this book here. Did I answer your question? Yeah. Now, the flip side of that is I hate answering questions about domestic aspen. I don't recommend planting them in your yard on the lawn. There's all kinds of issues with that, but that's another topic in, in total. <laughs> all right. Thanks, panel. Uh, I had kind of a question for you, Jess. Um, you mentioned the forest to faucet pipeline. Uh, could you just kind of expand on that a little bit? I think that's something that's really fascinating and that most people aren't really aware of. I think they think of fire and affecting ecosystems and air quality and wildlife and open space, but not so much uh, on water and things that we rely on. Yeah, and I didn't go into it. Um just for you know, the amount of time that we had, but if anybody in the room remembers the Dollar Ridge fire in 2018, um, severely impacted the Strawberry Reservoir and Strawberry River down in Duchesne County. Um, that was I, well, 18, 2018, they are still seeing um, washouts in the river. They've spent upwards of, and I'm going into the cost of this, but upwards of $40 million to retrofit the um, water treatment plant for central uh, water. And it's, it's a real 
it's a, it's a real impact of fire that, um, you know, like Paul was saying, you don't treat every acre that's out there, right? We're not gonna go treat the entire Wasatch Cache National Forest so that we can protect our watershed, but strategically putting fire on the ground and creating those patches to slow fire down and mitigate those um, uh, impacts on our water source is really the goal. And, and it's really a different way of thinking about mitigating for fire because we're not just doing fuel reduction, we're doing watershed protection. We're doing, you know, we're looking at houses, we're looking at cabins, we're looking at people, we're looking at resources, we're looking at people who live all the way down in Layton, you know, or past Ogden, you know, they're reliant on that watershed and, and it is really trying to get that, that tapped pipe, you know, pipeline into the forest. Yeah, thank you. I think that was really fascinating hearing from the Central Water um, folks just about everything that they've had to do and the effects that fire had on their their drinking water. And I guess I should add to, um, you know, so Mountain Regional Water is a supplier for our area and their intake is at the top of Rockport Reservoir. Um, and that is one of the reasons why we are focusing our efforts on the Upper Weber because um, in less than three hours of an impact of that pump station, we can lose 80% of our clean drinking water in our Snyderville and Park City area, except for the, you know, the Spiro Mines um, that bring in water for the Park City area, not, not the Snyderville Basin. So it is a real concern. I just point out quickly, uh, there's a historical element to all this too. And um, folks who work for federal agencies will know that the, the original establishment of the US Forest Service late 19th, early 20th century was number one was for watershed protection. It wasn't for timber and all that. And some of the prime examples, uh, the Weaver Basin, and then down around Ephraim, Utah are, are from this area as to you know, why and how this agency was established. And then also what is not widely known is the settlers of the 19th century, and, and it, it doesn't matter if it's Utah or California or Arizona, the prime practices after you grazed or logged were to burn, to set things on fire and walk away. And so a lot of that burning from that era that's 120 to 150 years ago, um, we're seeing the residuals of that now, a lot of human starts that were not Native uh, American starting fires, but were uh, the settlers, sort of, you might think of it as pre-regulation America. And so that was the logging practices of the day were to cut and light things on fire and walk away. For grazing is obvious, they wanted the regrowth, uh, but the idea was for um, to burn the residual timber on the ground, that was the, the given practice. Now, things got so bad, the watershed protection is that the people of Utah, again, all the Western states requested aggressively that we have a federal agency regulate these things, which is interesting contrast to today, right? when we're out there harping about how bad these agencies are, because things were so bad in Ephraim, they had a, um, a high mortality of human beings from landslides because of grazing practices during that era, grazing and fire, but cutting and fire. Yeah, I, I've been really involved with the noxious weed management in Summit County. We've got a really proactive um, Summit County uh, weed management agency that works with the county and, and the special service districts, but um, specifically garlic mustard is one of our biggest concerns. Um, it does um, excrete into the soil, outcompetes natives. Um, it creates um, that much like cheatgrass, it dries out and creates that kind of thicket of, of that quick um, fire start, um, those seeds are viable for 500 years or so. I mean, it's, it's ridiculous. 
Um, and it does feel like an uphill battle, um, but we found great success with hand pulling and then following up with um, a herbicide treatment on the seedlings. Um, there's just techniques of, um, you know, goat grazing is a really nice one um, to do, especially with the thistles and the other, and, and I'm not sure if goats will eat cheatgrass. Probably, probably. They, yeah, yeah. <laughs> the only thing they won't eat is choke cherry. I have <laughs> learned that, but um, yeah, it makes them sick. But um, yeah, there's there's a lot going on with that, and it is it is part of the planning cycle because first you don't want to spread the weeds when you're doing the treatments, and then you also want to identify where those areas are so that you can go back reseed um, and and try to outcompete those that are creating a higher you know fire danger. Bromus. Bromus marginalis. Bromus tectorum. tectorum. Yeah. So, yeah, hot and flashy. Brad, did you want to say anything there? I, I'm not hearing the questions. So oh, I think it. I darn think it. the the mic got turned off, but I can you hear uh, me now. He talked about, by the way, allelopathic plants in the understory. By the way, that's just a fancy term for the these plants that bully others, either physically or chemically. Um, and so he asked if uh, if we're aware of any in the Rocky Mountain West of a of these types of plants that. Uh, uh, make it difficult for trees or other plants to grow in forest settings. Could you hear that, Brad? <laughs> yeah, I did hear that. Um, I'm, I'm not sure as far as trees, but I mean, one of the major concerns with cheatgrass is that all competing with native grasses and other native vegetation, and, and we are seeing a little bit of sagebrush decline. Um, and, and like the one slide that I showed actually on Swan or Nature Preserve, where we have seen the cheatgrass die off and 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 that void is being filled with uh, we saw we've seen sagebrush die off and we that void's being filled by cheatgrass so and and i you know if you get out like into the great basin i mean there's areas that you could almost look at them as being ecological deserts where cheatgrass is just taken over and and replaced the native vegetation yeah Another yeah so there's, there's cheatgrass you know we keep going back to, we're talking millions of acres you know a lot of the whole state of nevada for example um, and so that's really important that we, uh, we understand that. And the other part is it, it kills out other species or drives them away, perhaps uh, somewhat allelopathically, but mostly back to our central point is changing the fire regime. So sagebrush uh, re reburns or regrows in, depending on the species of sagebrush from five to two, 300 years, fire regimes. However, if you start a fire cycle of every three years, where, where does a woody species of any kind grow? And that's kind of where you get these whole type conversions over really large areas. And, and along with the uh, fire, um, you know, cheatgrass, as has been mentioned before, and I think Paul mentioned it, it, it comes in early in the growing season. So it's a, a cool grass that comes in, uses the available moisture before the native vegetation really has, has taken on. And uh, that, that's another part of, of cheatgrass out competing some of the natives along with altering the uh, fire frequency. Yeah, thank you. Uh, and just real quickly to add to that, like um, Brad had mentioned um, that that early detection and rapid response is like one of the most prime sentences you can take away from dealing with noxious weeds. If you see it in your yard and it doesn't belong there, get rid of it before it goes to seed. It, it's just, just get it before it goes to seed. <laughs> That's your goal. I've got guides available. Uh, we've got PDF guides, we've got paper guides for everyone here. Uh, another allelopathic plant to kind of answer your question is Dyer's Woad. Um, but I don't know if that really is kind of contributing to the, to the fire regime, but it's something that we do see a lot of. And I know that there's some people in the audience who are very familiar with it. Um, I think uh, the concern with Dyer's Woad or any invasive, I mean, if you have that disturbance mechanism, like an area burns from a fire, um, it, it, it leaves that area open to uh, invasives coming in e a lot easier than if native vegetation was in place. Uh, I, Jess, I kind of have a question for you and maybe Brad, um, kind of looking forward into work that's gonna be done in the county. Are there things that uh, people are gonna be seeing that you want them to be aware of, kind of projects that are upcoming or work that's going on right now that they can keep an eye out for or just be aware of and when they're driving and their friend in the car is like, oh my gosh, oh my, yeah, to borrow from Paul, gosh, uh, what is that? Yeah, no, that's good. Um, 
I, I like to point to Summit Park as a great example of looking um, at some post recovery of, of treatment. Um, it was, it's really shocking. People don't like change. It's, it's hard to see trees cut down. It's hard to see vegetation removed. Um, but it's also really interesting to see how quickly it returns and in what state it returns in. Um, Toll Canyon and Summit Park have been treated um, now, I think we're going on year four um, or in, in various stages, but the wildflowers in the summer are incredible. And they weren't there, I mean, they were there before, but they were underneath the shrubs, right? And we've released them. Um, so if anybody wants to see what a, um, a shaded fuel break looks like, what a um, just a, a regular thinning looks like and see that post recovery go there. Um, Park City is doing a lot of work on Treasure Hill. That's very visual. Um, Deer Valley is gonna be burning a lot of their piles. They, they've been doing some really creative um, thinning in the, in the winter, right after they closed the mountain down, they've been using snow cats to do removal of, of some trees. So it's a low impact way of doing um, tree removal. So when you're skiing at Deer Valley, you'll notice the, the glading that's happening there, but they're also gonna be burning piles. Um, there'll be piles burning around town. And I think that's probably gonna be the most visual part of, of the winter and this fall um, into next spring is, um, you know, don't discredit seeing smoke in the air, but think about it before you call 911. And, and um, you know, we don't want to flood our emergency management system, but if you have concerns, obviously call it in, but realize that some of these plumes of smoke that you're seeing up on the hillsides when there's 10 feet, or whatever, we don't get 10 feet of snow anymore. <laughs> <laughs> what am I talking about? I haven't got the dog off the roof in about five years. So. <laughs> um, but yeah, I mean, there, there's feet of snow on the ground. The likelihood of having a crown fire is very low. Um, it could be a house fire, but you know, I'd, so yeah, smoke in the air is a, is a great thing to pay attention to. Yeah, something that'll be visible and, and usually lots of signage and press about that as well, so. Yeah. A little bit off the subject, but are any of the government agencies, the planning commi commissions, starting to talk about making your house uh, more defensible? Are they starting to acquire metal roofs, uh, grates across the eaves, et cetera? Yeah, actually, um, uh, jointly, Park City and Summit County are applying for a $50 million FEMA grant right now, fingers crossed. Um, and part of that is to do a pilot project to see if we can help um, mid offset some of the costs of what it takes. Um, I personally put siding on my house a few years ago, and I understand how expensive that is um, up in, you know, the $30,000 range. You know, it, it takes years to pay that loan off, right? It's like buying a car. Um, so it, it does take a lot. And so looking at programs so where we can get some federal funding to help. And FEMA is very um, <coughs> active in, in trying to mitigate the, the home loss. And so... Yeah, like I said, fingers crossed. Uh, just another and, and aspect. Park City, Go ahead, Brad. Park City Municipal Corporation does have coding restrictions as far as for new construction that uh, meets, I believe, 2006 WUI codes that were established. So, yeah, another aspect of this is we should all be aware that we are part of the problem, all of us, and our system is set up to incentivize developing that cool piece of land on a mountainside. Well, every additional home that we put, regardless of where it is in, in fire prone landscapes, increases the cost, increases the danger for the homeowners and firefighters, all that. So I, I often think about what's the band-aid and what's the cause. And uh, the cause is a lot more difficult in many natural resource situations. But the cause here is, do we keep selling and developing uh, in these fire prone landscapes and pretending that fire doesn't occur. The analogy is very apt about developing in a floodplain. A fire is a natural disturbance that's gonna come sooner or later. Um, we have a lot of laws against developing in floodplains. We know rivers flood, but we don't have the same mentality yet. And again, our system is set up to incentivize even further reaching out, further development. And I realize this is a huge, difficult problem. I don't want to make it sound simple. However, that's the base cause of a lot of what we're talking about tonight. One of the elements within what's called the cohesive strategy 
for um, wildland fire is a shared responsibility. So if you if you choose to live in what Paul has elaborately talked about as far as the wildland urban interface and Jess have also, has also, um, you know, you have a shared responsibility to treat the fuels around your house, to have fire hardened structures so that a firefighter like myself is not put at risk trying to protect those. And at the same time, you know, also within that mix is, um, you know, what Jess talked about as far as developing resilient landscapes and doing treatments, especially and in, in using Paul's concept, doing those treatments closer into um, developed areas so that if a fire were to start, it's going to stay as a surface fire and we can we can manage it better and and have a successful suppression outcome versus uh, if, if those areas closer into the wooey are not treated and, and you know, the mixed conifer again, a, a fire like Parley's Canyon, if that had started maybe a, a mile up the road or winds had been a little bit different, um, that mixed conifer stand that hadn't been treated, um, it was, it. there's modeling that shows that the fire would have burned um, definitely into the upper reaches of, of Summit Park. Yeah, and to that shared responsibility, thanks for bringing that up. I, each and every one of you can go back to your communities and talk to a neighbor and be that neighborhood ambassador. You know, we've got two great ambassadors that I know sitting there have been working on the trail system in our area for a long time. Share that same knowledge with your neighbors about FireWise and how you can be a, you know, a fire adapted community. There's lots of information online. Um, Fire Adapted Communities is a great website. It has a lot of information. Um, USU's extension site is amazing for information. Um, but yeah, take take the initiative to be that ambassador for, for your neighborhood. I just wanna give a big thanks to our panelists. Thank you so much for coming tonight, Brad. Thank you for zooming in um, from an active fire. And thanks to our audience for your wonderful questions and participating today. We'll send out that follow-up email with resources um, and some contact info if you have further questions and all kinds of stuff. So thank you.